groups and computers. In this nugget, I'm talking about groups and computers, which don't really seem to have much to do with one another, except for a few things, but uh, I'm just covering them here because this is kind of where they fell in my schedule. All right, we'll talk about the purpose of all, first of all, of groups, why we want to use groups instead of individual accounts. I'll show you some illustration of that when we get started here. And then we'll also talk about the management of those groups. Where do you manage them? Mostly that's going to be in Active Directory users and computers. We also see that we can use or change the scope of a specific security group, and we need to identify what scope is, uh, where a, a, a security group can be used, where its membership can come from, and where we generally use it. And also, what about computers? Particularly, we're going to take a look at the fact that computers actually have accounts that also log on. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to use groups every day, even when I'm not in front of the computer. If it's the evening time and it's time for the family to go out for a nice evening meal, for example, I might yell up the stairs and say, come on, everybody, it's time to go. I'm usually the hungriest one in the family, so I'm a little bit urgent when I say, come on, let's get going. And uh, anyway... Well, what I do there is I say, come on, everybody, instead of calling out individual names. And the advantage of that is it's so much simpler than trying to remember each individual name. Come on, Cooper. Come on, Marina. Come on, oh, there's a, a third kid in there somewhere. And then calling my wife, I just say, come on, everyone. So it's so much easier. And it's similar in the IT world where we can use groups to simplify our lives. So as an example, let me just go here into Phoenix OU and right-click here to choose a new group and I'll just quickly create one here we'll just call this the fantastic four okay my fantastic four it's a global security group we'll talk about what these different things are in a moment but by default it does go to creating a global security group and that'll be fine for my current purposes the next thing I might want to do is to populate that with guess what the membership of course here I'll go to members and I'm gonna click on add and then I'll just select the individual users. I could type them in here, you know, Susan Storm, for example, or rather Susan Richards, excuse me. I can also click Add and do this again, or uh, I can click on Advanced and just find Now, and then I can look for the individual accounts that I want to add into that, and I'll just kind of shift-click each one of these things. And who's am I missing? Reed Richards, there it is. So I shift-clicked and chose a few of those different accounts, and I click OK, and OK, and now I've got these four members of the security group. Okay, so I, then I click OK. Notice one thing, let me go back to this. One thing I could have also done, in addition to changing the membership, is I could have also nested this Fantastic Four Global Group inside of some other group. I don't really have any right now, but I could click on Add here and add the membership to another group. And further by way of example, I can open up a share or a resource of some kind. Let me create a new folder here, and we'll just call this, um, you know, Fantastic Documents. Okay, so um, I've got some documents in here maybe, you know, something like uh, our plan to take over the world. Okay, a little bit weird on the spacing there, but you get the idea. So we've got some things going on here that we want to make available to people, but I w want to share this. and Maybe they need to access this over the network, for example. Well, I'll right-click on this and choose Share, but now I need to specify the actual account that I'm looking for, which is going to be the Fantastic Four, uh, the Fantastic Four uh, Security Group. So I'll just type in here Fantastic. That should be good enough. There's the Fantastic Four, and I can make these people you know, contributors or co-owners or whatever. Contributors, of course, meaning that they have the ability to add. Uh, change and delete documents, but they don't have the ability to do things like change permissions. So then I click on share and continue. And that's pretty much it. Now I have a shared document for anybody who's a member of that particular security group. So for example, now if I make a remote desktop connection to my Vista client computer here and I log on as Sue Richards, um, when this user logs on then, it's going to notice that she's a member of that security group and there's going to be in her SID or her security identifier uh, information that specifies that she is indeed a member of that security group. So now what she can do is she can open up uh, Windows Explorer, and we'll just go to my computer here, and then I can just UNC to it or I can map a drive letter to it, but it's DC Nugget 1, and then I'm going to look for the fantastic documents. Okay, and there it is. Now I have the ability to access this document to be able to make certain changes to it, you know, whatever her plan is to take over the world, you know, turn everything invisible 
or something like this. Okay, so she saves this document, and there you go. So now we have the ability to access this. Now, by the same token, I'm going to quickly log this user off. Because of the fact that she was a member of that security group, she was able to access that resource. But I could have also accessed this as someone else, like my Ben Grimm account, at nuggetlab.com. And Ben Grimm will also be able to access this. Why? Because he's also a member of that same security group. In fact, so if we go in here and we go to DC Nugget 1 and then uh, Fantastic Documents or whatever that was that I, I had in there earlier. There it is, Fantastic Documents. Then we see that he is also able to do the same thing, you know, smash everything. Okay, so we have members of the Fantastic Four here that can make changes to that document. Okay, so when we see this going on, it's again because they're all members of this Fantastic Four security group. In fact, if I go back over to this, this particular uh, computer, this Vista computer, and go to Accessories and Command Prompt, you can use a command that I've used many times in the past, who am I, forward slash all, and we'll see that he's going to have security group membership in that group. Somewhere in here, am I missing it? Oh, there it is, it's right in front of me. Okay, so Nugalab Fantastic Four, we know that this person is a member of that group. That's why they're able to access that particular resource. Now, in the same way that I was able to use Active Directory users and computers to create this security group and be able to change its membership that we saw right here, notice that I can also remove members if I want to. It's very easy to do that way as well. Uh, here I can also make changes to multiple accounts at once. And this is kind of going back to our individual user account item here, but this is something that's still important to know. Maybe I want also these first five user Phoenix user accounts to also be a membership in the Fantastic Four security group. I guess that'd actually be the, what the Fantastic Nine now. But anyway, I can select individual accounts or all of them at once. I just selected the first one, held down shift, clicked on the last one. If I want to uh, exclude individual ones, I can also hold down control and pick out individual ones that I want to uh, add or remove here. Uh, but in this case, I'm okay with all of this. And I'm going to right click here to go to the properties. Notice that I can go do this from the properties or I can just click add to a group. Let's try this one first. By adding it to a group, I just choose Fantastic Four. Okay, and I'll check the names, and I could then just click OK, and then they would be added. I can also go here to right click on it and choose properties. And it's within this that we don't really want to talk about security group membership, so, so to speak. But I do want to emphasize something I've shown you before, as long as I'm here. And that is that you can do a lot of these different things, and you can fill them in for all of these different people. So, for example, you know, maybe I've got the www.nuggetlab.com web page for all of these people. Maybe there's something about their uh, account that I can always do. I can change their logon hours for every one of them, for example, if I wanted to do that. I can change information in their profile, like a profile path. In their organization, I can just say, you know, department, you know, Phoenix operations. Okay? So just keep in mind the different kinds of things that you can select from here to change multiple items at once for any given user's account. Okay. Now once I have done that, I can go back to an individual user account here, go back to, for example, organization, and any of the users that I had selected in the previous uh, view there would also have Phoenix Operations for their department. Now let me get back to what I was saying earlier. I'll right-click here, add to a group, you know, Fantastic, Fantastic Four, and I just type in enough to be unique, and then I press Enter to click OK. And then we'll see here that these user accounts now are a member of the Fantastic Four security group. Okay, and that's pretty much it, all there is to it. It's just that easy. Now as I return to the interface here, and we'll go back to my Fantastic Four security group, notice that it is now a global group. I don't know if you remember this when I first created it, but initially all three of these radio buttons were available, but now these two are. Why is that? Well, I can switch back and forth between these various types. Notice that also, when I go to a universal group, it then makes available the domain local group. But if I apply here, then now the global group becomes unavailable. Now, why is that? Because some of these things are kind of exclusive so that you cannot switch directly from one group scope to the other. And we'll take a look a little bit more at what the group scope means here in just a moment. In fact, let's do that now. Here I've got a document that I've created for you called groupscope.pdf. 
This is a document that's available for you up on NuggetLab.com. And for the Domain Local Security Group, you can nest, you can put inside of a Domain Local Security Group a user account from any domain in the forest. So, for example, even if I had, you know, a forest like this, hopefully your forests look a little neater than mine, you know, maybe I've got a user account down here, and I've got a, a Domain Local Group up here. And I'll just call, call this Domain Local. You know, and I'll put a big circle around it. That's a group. I can take this user account and nest them inside of this domain local security group. Okay. Likewise, other things that I can do there is I can take a global or universal group from any domain in the forest. So likewise, if I had a global group down here, you know, global group, I could nest that also inside of this domain local group. I'm kind of running out of space there. But you see that there's a G with a circle around it. That's another group I could nest inside of that domain local group. Now, likewise, if I had another forest, maybe it wasn't part of our infrastructure initially, but we had a company merger or something like that, and now we've set up a trust relationship with this other forest over here, then they might have a user account down here as well. Okay, they could have a, a user account down there, a global group, or a universal group. All of those would work, so an, also a global group or a universal group. And all three of these kind of objects could also be nested inside of a domain local group. Okay, so all of those could go inside of there as well. Again, note that they're from a totally separate domain, in this case a trusted forest. And finally then, of course, I could also take a domain local security group, maybe I've got another domain local security group here in the same domain, and I could nest that inside of this domain local group as well. Basically, when you take a look at domain local groups, you can put anything inside of it, from any domain in its own forest, or any domain in a trusted forest. So really, domain local is wide open to just about any kind of membership. The only thing that it cannot accept inside of it would be a domain local group from some other domain. So for example, down here, if I had another domain local group, I would not be able to nest it inside of this domain local group up here. I can't go across domains with that. Domain locals are just that. They're local. That's what the L is for there. They're local to their own domain. But they can pull into them, inside of them, any account or other kind of a group from any domain in the forest except for other domain local groups. Now, why would I want to create a security group like this, a domain local security group? The main focus for domain local groups is going to be resource access. Okay? And that's also in your PDF file, so that's why I'm not being too terribly neat here because I don't necessarily have to be. Uh, but here it says resources in the local domain. So once I've created this domain local group with all this kind of different contents inside of it, I might have a folder here. And maybe I've got, you know, users and groups from down here, users and groups from down here that all have something in common. Maybe they're all HR departments for the different uh, domains throughout my organization. And maybe this is the HR folder, which happens to be on a server in this domain. Well, that would be a good example of creating a security group that would collect users and groups from far-flung locations throughout my environment, put them into a single domain local group, and then grant them access to uh, this human resources folder. Likewise, another thing I could do, let me choose a different color so it's a little bit easier to read here now. Too much black going on in this. Uh, then the other thing I could do is to maybe I'd have a printer here. And you know, this is supposed to be paper coming out of a printer you know, with words on it and stuff. I can also take that same domain local group and assign it permissions on this printer. Now what I've done is by using a group, I didn't have to assign permissions to each individual user and security group that were already nested inside of this. I just assigned permissions to this one group. Same with this printer now. I don't have to assign permissions individually to this user and this global group and this universal group and so forth. I just do it once for this security group, this domain local security group that I already created at a prior point in time. Next here, let's go ahead and talk about global groups. Here I've got a global group, and what can it, can it, what can it accept? Any user account in the same domain. So I could take that user account and put it inside of this global group. I can also nest inside of it other global groups from the same domain. If I already had another global group, well, it could be nested inside of here as well. But notice that it can only contain objects from the same domain. If I have a user account down here, there's no way to put that user account in this global group right up here. Uh, where I can use it though? Well, once I've created this security group, this global group, I can apply it anywhere throughout the domain, uh, throughout the forest, or throughout any trusted forests. So let's say here I've got a folder, and again, maybe this is going to be my you know, HR folder or something like that. 
Once I've created this global group, I can actually assign permissions to it to this shared folder now. So yes, I cannot take this user account and put it in here, but I can take the group that's already been created and uh, assign permissions to various resources with it. And the overall idea for this, for global groups, generally speaking, you don't have to use them this way, but generally speaking, they're for users of common type. Okay, so this would be maybe departmental users. Maybe all of the membership in this global group is all HR people. Well, that would be a good example of using a global group. Now, finally, with universal groups, these are very flexible groups. This is the universal group right here. I don't know, kind of looks like Waldo or something like that. Here's his head, and here's the nose, and you know, here's an eye, and here's an eye. But anyway, <laughs> I guess I better erase that. Uh, but that's a universal group is very flexible because it can accept universal groups from its own domain, global groups from its own domain, users from its own domain, as well as universal groups from some other domain, and global groups from some other domain in the same forest. So uh, in some ways, like domain local groups, which are very flexible and can accept membership from just about anywhere, uh, universal groups do that, plus you can also use them anywhere. Remember, a domain local security group could only be used in its own domain right here. But a universal security group, once I've created it and created its membership the way I like it, I can take this universal security group and assign it to permissions down here somewhere. Again, whoops, that's supposed to be a folder. <laughs> you know, a folder or something like that. I can, again, assign permissions to this universal group now. And likewise, once again, if I had some other, you know, trusted forest over here that we established a trust relationship with as well, then, of course, I could assign that universal group uh, permissions on some resource over there also. Now, let me return to one other thing here as well as I go to the, you know, fantastic forest security group here. Notice that we have security and distribution security groups. The purpose of a distribution security group is that it can be used with email programs to email anybody that's a member of this distribution security group. So an email in this case would go to all of these users right here. Uh, some email programs, even if you use a security group, you can still send an email to the security group as well. So distribution group like that might not be quite as necessary as they used to be depending upon the email program that you're using. And of course, these can also be switched back and forth as you need. Now let me switch gears here and talk now about computers. Now we've got a couple of computers here. I've got a DC Nugget 3 computer and a Vista Client 01. We talked earlier in a previous Nugget about how you can use redirect computer to specify that computers go to a specific OU when they're created instead of just this generic computer's container. And the advantage of that for that really comes into play when you start to implement group policy objects, which again, we'll talk about here in the future. Now, with the Vista Client 01 computer, however, it doesn't really matter where it is right now, but we're just going to work with this individual computer account. As I double click on this, notice that it has a, a few different things that we could do. You know, you could change the group membership of a computer, for example. We don't really do that very often. By default, they're members of the domain computer computer's security group, but you can also add them to another group membership if, for example, that computer itself needed access to some kind of a back-end database or some kind of a uh, B2B solution or a business-to-business -business solution, for example. The other thing I could do, let me just go back up to Phoenix, is I could right-click here to choose New Computer. Notice that when I do that, I can just enter in the name, you know, I'll just put Vista Client 02, for example. Uh, and then I could click ov over here and click OK just to go ahead and pre-stage that computer account. And also the advantage for creating the computer account in advance here is so that once I do that, if I haven't already used something like redirect computer and I have a very s focused destination where I want to put this computer account, then by creating it in advance, once I go to that Vista Client 02 computer and join it to the domain, it's automatically going to connect to this computer object right here, and it's not going to be dumped into the computer's container, for example. So it's kind of a way of pre-staging the exact location of where I want these accounts to go. So I almost forgot to do this by whiteboard. <laughs> so anyway, we're on the subject of computers, and I just showed you how we can join them to a domain. Remember, and this again is something that we've done many times in the past, you can also join a computer to a domain by right-clicking on computer, choosing properties, and having chosen properties, you can go here to change settings. Then this will just take you to the advanced system properties, and I'll have to enter in credentials here since I'm not logged on as an administrator account. And then once that's been done, you can simply go to the computer name tab 
and click on change and then specify the domain that you want it to be, to be a member of. Normally it's going to be a member of a work group by default for most cases so we'll just specify the name of the domain and click OK and OK. After restarting the computer it would then be a member of the domain. Now one thing to keep in mind with your computer accounts is that they are actually users. Yes, computers have a username and it's going to be the name of the computer, so in this case VistaClient01 and then dollar sign appended to the end. In fact, if you look at the event log for like security events that we looked at in our last nugget, then you saw that you probably saw that there were some computer accounts listed there that ended in dollar sign. Okay, so that's their username and they also have a password. When you first join a computer to the domain, uh, a, a password is agreed upon between the domain controller and that client computer and then what happens is every 30 days or within every 30 days they they will mutually agree to reset the password for that computer account now this is to ensure that only domain computers are actually logging on and accessing domain resources uh, otherwise anybody can access the domain resources the other thing that you got to keep in mind there is if the computer is unable to properly log on to the domain somehow and contact a domain controller then it may not allow your users to log on either because the computer has to log on first before the user can log on then the user logs on to the same domain controller that the computer was able to find and log on to Another thing to keep in mind there though is sometimes you need to renew the password. For example, if the computer is a laptop computer and someone's out on an extended trip or maybe they're overseas or maybe they've uh, taken the laptop with them on maternity leave or uh, just whatever. Well, if they're gone 30 days or more, then the, compa the computer password has expired and when they come back into the domain they try to log on, they're going to get an error message saying that they were unable to contact the domain controller or the account has expired or something like that. If that takes place, uh, what Microsoft says you can do, oops, clicked on the wrong thing there, what Microsoft says you can do is to right click on the account and then just choose to reset the account. Okay, and are you sure you want to do this? Yes. Now, the advantage to that is supposed to be the, that if this computer account is already the member of some security groups that you've taken painstaking effort to set up, and if the computer account has already assigned permissions on some resources and things like this, then then that's supposed to be an advantage because you don't have to recreate that specific computer account. However, even after you reset that computer account, uh, then you do still have to go back to wherever the computer uh, is and you still have to re We reboot. We're not going to reboot right now. We're just going to go back to change, go to domain, choose nuggetlab.com, and OK. Then we'll enter in our credentials again. Again, user account control is uh, killing me right here. <laughs> have to keep entering in all that in. So anyway, once I've entered in the correct credentials, without rebooting, I've saved myself, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, minute and a half. Some computers take a long time to restart. Um, then, now I can click OK through all of this and reboot the computer. And we've been able to successfully reassociate it and regenerate a password with the domain.
Okay, so we click OK here, click OK here, close, restart now, and now when this computer comes back up, it'll be healthy again with the domain. And so that's how we handle those expired passwords for computers that might have been out of the office for a little too long. In this nugget, we talked about groups and computers. We first of all started talking about the purpose of groups. And of course, the main thing there is we don't want to work with individual user accounts. I mean, can you imagine in a large organization with thousands of users, you wouldn't want to individually manage all of those user accounts for permissions purposes. No, instead you want to put them inside of groups and then assign permissions to those groups. It's going to be much, much easier. We also took a look at how to manage those security groups. Mostly that's going to be done through Active Directory Users and Computers. Then we saw that we could change the group membership and we could also select multiple users at once and add them to a group membership, for example. We also saw some things about the scope of security groups. Remember we have the domain local, global, and universal security groups. They all have kind of different, uh, different membership that they can contain and a little bit different usage as well. We finally took a look at computers. Mainly we wanted to identify that they are actually user accounts with usernames and passwords and that those passwords can expire which would then prevent you from being able to log on to the domain. And we talked about how to remedy that. Well, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.